Well, hello, friends. It is lovely to be back in the beautiful city of Memphis with you. Thank you for the hospitality of a return visit. Amber talked about my almost mystical experience yesterday at Gus's famous fried chicken. And uh, when I say the mystical experience, uh, I mean that somewhat literally, that in the beginning, there was Omid Safi, and there was a fried chicken. And once these two had that most mystical experiences of a union, then there was no more chicken, and there was no more Omid. There was only this new creature. <laughs> All duality had vanished, and there was pure bliss that remained. And I'd like to think of that as a harbinger of the divine experience of unity. And the subject for today, which is love, and a love that is intended to help us rise beyond the boundaries of our ego, of the ways that we see ourselves as these finite, limited creatures, and to be one with the keeper of the stars. There is a way, and that path is love. It is a love that calls us to our highest aspiration. And in this particular tradition, they often teach us through a whole set of stories, beautiful, heartfelt stories that speak to us today as they have to people over the centuries. I'd like to share a few of these with you in the time that we have. And should you desire more mystical union, come back tomorrow for some more. There's a wonderful story that the great mystic Rumi, arguably the most famous and beloved of all the love mystics of the Islamic tradition, says of a person who goes to the house of God. And he has come with so much seeking and so much desire and he knocks at the door, and he hears the voice of God coming from the inside. And God says in a gentle voice, who is it? And the seeker says, it's me. And the voice of God comes back saying, in this abode, there's only room for the one. You're not done cooking yet. You're still raw. Go. Go and taste of the fire of this love and come back when you're cooked. So the seeker wanders in the desert of the soul. He tastes of the fire of love and he comes back when he's gone from being raw to being cooked very much as we hope, with all apologies to our vegetarian friends, that the beef what? What is it that we're having? Corn beef, that the corn beef, you wouldn't want to have raw corn beef. You'd want it to be cooked. And it's cooked in the fire of love. All the people here take their love and they put it into that food. And the seeker has likewise been cooked in the fire of love and he comes back to God's house, and he knocks yet again. And again, lovingly, he hears the voice of the divine saying, who is it? Now, this time, he's learned his lesson. And he says, it is you, O charmer of hearts. It is you, beloved. And he hears the voice of God saying, well, since it's me, O oh, thou me, enter into me. Okay. 
in many churches on the East, in many mosques and synagogues in the East, and in fact in many homes in the East. When you enter the sacred sites, you leave your shoes outside. You take off your sandals before you enter somebody's house because you don't want to be dragging the dirt of the outside world into somebody's home. What if the shoes that you're taking off are your sense of ego, that you cannot enter into the divine presence as long as your three favorite people in the world are still me, myself, and I? What if there is a love that calls us to rise above this limited notion of the self? in which we all say, it's you, O oh beloved. We hear many of these kinds of stories, again, in this particular tradition. There's a wonderful story from Rumi's mentor that in the Day of Judgment, God summons up all the angels and all the souls who have ever been. And this particular soul named Shams is in the back of the crowd. And he's not particularly pleased to be in the back of the room because he wants to behold the face of God. And so he's like jumping up to catch a glimpse of the divine, but there's so many people ahead of him. And so he starts shouting. And he says, I brought the one thing that he lacks. Everybody turns around. What is this madman saying? He brings the one thing that God lacks, and the angels all turn to God in surprise and saying, O oh Lord on high, what is this man saying? And God says, That is Shams, my beloved child, and he speaks the truth. And Shams says, I will reveal what God lacks, but I will not do it from back here. I will show you what God is missing, but only if you all part, like the Red Sea, and I get to walk right up front, because I want to see the face of God up close. And the angels look at God and like, is he making this up? And God is like, no, Shams is telling the truth. And they all part, and Shams walks up front, his face lit up, with anticipation of that intimate glance of God that he has been waiting for. And all the people are turning around and looking at Shams, wondering what God lacks. And the angels are puzzled and dazed. And Shams gets to the front and he says, my Lord, my beloved, I bring you the one thing that you have been missing. Complete and total need. For I am in need of you, and I depend on you, and you are the one without need. Now that I have brought my needfulness and my dependence to you, now you have the one thing that you were missing. And God is pleased with champs. There is a love in which the goal is not to accumulate more and more happiness for us, more and more pleasure for ourselves, but rather to serve, to extend of ourselves for another. And if you are sitting here, you too have offered this love to someone, and someone has surely offered it to you. And if with the passage of time, your own heart has become a little hardened, maybe a little cynical, and you're thinking, I don't, I can't think of when I ever loved so selflessly, that there wasn't a bit of my ego in it, when love wasn't 
transactional. Even when the ones that we have made these solemn promises to, that if we find ourselves in these conversations of, well, it's your turn to do the dishes because I took out the trash and I have got an itemized list of everything that I have done in this marriage and alphabetized in reverse chronological order, right? If those kinds of thoughts have ever emerged in your heart and you're thinking, I don't, I haven't tasted this love that is so pure, think back to maybe when you had a child. And if that has not been or will not be a blessing for you, think back to that time when you were somebody's baby. All of us in this room were once somebody's baby. Whether the one who raised you was your mama, was a grandma, was someone who took you into their home and took you into their heart and raised you, there was a time that you cried out in love and in hunger and in thirst in the middle of the night before you had words, and crying out was all that you could do. And somebody, and let's be honest, it's usually the mama, Somebody got up in the middle of the night when they had not had eight straight hours of sleep for 18 months. Now, we have a word for that kind of sleep deprivation, and that word is torture. <laughs> International human rights law prohibits the deprivation of sleep as a method of torture. And yet, if you're sitting here, somebody once loved you. Somebody once got up with you in the middle of the night. And you know what they didn't do? They did not make a cost-benefit chart to decide if they should get out of bed. They did not sit there and say, well, this child just ate three hours ago, and I, on the other hand, have not slept for eight straight months. So let this child cry. And in fact, let her cry the next time and the time after that, because I just want to get a good night's sleep. No. When you hear the voice of a child, and especially if that is the child that you've taken into your heart, you leap. Love compels you to rise beyond yourself. You go and you pick up that child and you take her, you take him into your arms, you put your bosom or that milk bottle into the child to directly provide love and care and comfort. There is a love that we do without thinking, without reason, because that love is what has brought us here. That love is what sustains us here, and that same love will deliver us back home. The mystics of this particular tradition talk about this love as being a taste a flavor of God's own love. You've been brought here. You have been made through love. You are sustained through love. And if we can get over our own damn selves and learn to love each other again, that same love will take us back to the arms of our Divine Mother, Divine Father. One of the teachings that the mystics of Islam teach us is that God desires himself in us. God desires herself through us. 
One of the beautiful little teachings that they have is this powerful little line that you've got to sit with. These poems are a little bit like a rich dessert. You don't want to gulp it down quickly. You want to savor the taste of that. What kind of dessert do we have today? Fudge pie. You got to let your tongue make love to that fudge pie. You got to let your tongue become intimate with that fudge until they have a mystical union. Right? You don't want to just gulp it down. Let your tongue have pleasure. And let your heart have pleasure through some of these poems. This one is from the 1200s. God loves himself in you. God loves himself in you. which at least has a couple of meanings. That when God looks at you, there's divine pleasure. This is my child with whom I am pleased. This is a soul that I have made. Look at this lovely form. Right? When was the last time that you got up in the morning and you went to the bathroom and the first glimpse of yourself that you get in the mirror, you say to yourself, what a lovely creature God has made. Or do you say, I'm a good southern boy, so my language is a little salty, you look like a piece of shit warmed over again. <laughs> Which way do we speak when we behold ourselves? When did you forget that the maker of all the stars loves himself in you? You would never walk down the street, at least I hope not, could go up to a random stranger and say, you look like a piece of shit warmed over again. You would never go up to your child, good morning, daddy. You look like a piece of crap. You would never do that. Why would we do it to our own selves? And then, God loves himself in you. That that bit of God, that divine spirit that is in you, that God adores. What would it be like if as we go around, we could come to love each other like this? Then we get to the point that we realize we're not just seeking God. God is also seeking us. Right? We know this. This is one of the great secrets of all the great traditions. Rabbi Heschel reminds us, God in search of man. Today we would hope to say God in search of humanity. There's a wonderful story of a great Muslim mystic, Bayezid, who when he first learns how to really pray, not just mechanically, mechanically mouth and words, but really and truly say the words with the presence of heart. And he experiences that mystical presence of God. The first time that God is not an idea in his head or words on a page, but a warmth and a light in his heart. He says, my Lord, I have been seeking you for 60 years. And God answers him back saying, my child, I have been seeking you since before there was a thing called time. The whole purpose of creation, according to this tradition, 
was that God wanted to be known. I was a hidden treasure, and I loved to be known. I longed to be known. I yearned to be known. So I created. This creation is luminous. It is filled with light. When you see your own body, not even to say anything about your spirit, your body, your body is made of cosmic dust. You are made out of stars come together in you. Let me leave you with a couple of last thoughts for today. In this way, if we walk this path of love, yes, God is always the Lord, but God is also the Beloved. God is also the friend. One of these great mystics was asked one time, what does it mean to be a mystic? And he said, it's to be at ease with God. To be at ease with God. They said, we don't understand that. And he said, okay. Look at the way that a child sits in her mother's lap. This is how we are with God. That feeling of safety, of warmth, of love, of being cared for. We are with God as a toddler is in his mama's lap. These are the kinds of images that they use. For the Prophet Muhammad, who comes out of the same tradition as Amos, as Moses, as Abraham, and as of our Lord Jesus, the very last word that he uttered on earth was, Ar-Rafiq al-A'la, the highest friend. At his moment of passing, the highest friend. Let me end by sharing this two last words. There's a wonderful early mystic, a simple man, a shepherd. Not all of these mystics were university professors. In fact, being a university professor is probably one of the most harmful things you can do to your spiritual life. I know, I work in one. And one night, he has a dream of God. And God is teasing him. Because friends do that sometimes. And God says to him, I know every little dirty secret in your heart. I know every act of hypocrisy that you have committed. Do you want me to go and tell everybody all of your dirty little secrets? Do you want me to tell them that they all think you're so good and pious and righteous? But I will reveal everything that I know about you This mystic who's talking with his friend doesn't miss a beat. And he talks back to God as his friend. And he says, my sweet and beloved Lord, do you want me to go into the town and tell them your dirty little secret? Do you want me to go and tell them that you love every single one of them more than a mother loves her newborn child? Do you want me to tell them that no matter what you threaten us with, a mother would never throw her child into a fire, and you will never throw your creation into torment? And if I do, 
then I promise you, no one's going to tithe. No one's going to pray. No one's going to go to church, mosque, or synagogue. And there was a long pregnant pause. And he heard the voice of God come back and say, how about this? I say nothing. You say nothing. Now that story is a thousand years old. It's a story of love and friendship with God. And it's the story of people who are relating in this tender way with the beloved. I'm going to end the portion for today by reading you one more and one last poem. So the title that we had given for this talk was A Love That Mingles. A Love That Mingles. And these mystics had a bold idea that every single one of you will recognize. That if you claim to love God, God is easy. What has God ever done to you other than make you, love you, cherish you, sustain you, redeem you, and return you home? You know what's difficult? These two-legged beasts and demons. So their idea was, if you want to love God, you have to learn to love each other. You have to learn to love that bit of the divine that's in each of us. You cannot claim to be a righteous person, a religious person, a holy person, and be unkind to humanity. I don't care how many times you go to church, mosque, or synagogue. Show me how you're treating people, starting, Matthew 25, with the least of these. Show me how you're treating the poor, the orphan, the widow, the needy, the refugee. That will tell me how you are with God. So this is the poem called Mingling, about one love, a mystical experience of being with the divine. It's a roomy poem. Look, love mingles with lovers. See, spirit mingling with the body. How long will you see life as this and that, good and bad? Look at how this and that are mingled. How long will you speak of this world and that world? see this world and that world mingling. May God make of us, make of you, a people of mingling. May God make of you a people in whom what is divine and what is human mingles. May we be a people of healing and comfort and love in this world and in all the worlds to come.